Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Andrew Wilson, and I'm the executive director here at the Center for International Private Enterprise. And it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you here this morning for the rollout of our uh, uh, digital advocacy guide that we've been doing in cooperation with New Markets Lab, more of which you'll, you'll hear about later, but I think there are probably some copies floating around somewhere if you're interested in getting a hard copy. I was asked just to give a quick welcoming remark to all of you and, and explain to you why an organization like the Center for International Private Enterprise uh, is interested in the topic of the digital economy. Uh, it might sound rather obvious, but I think it's sometimes worth restating. You know, uh, as an organization that works at the nexus of market economy and democracy, uh, we get to see firsthand uh, the challenges in emerging markets of taking advantage of um, both globalization, but also the barriers that exist for companies in trying to take advantage of globalization. And I think all of us in this room in recent years have come to appreciate uh, that with globalization has come great economic growth and prosperity, but also challenges have emerged. Uh, and uh, at SIPE, what we're phrasing the challenge as is democratizing opportunity and democratizing globalization. And the challenge that's in front of us is how do we use the tools at hand to ensure that the positive effects of globalization reach as many people as possible. Uh, that globalization doesn't just become a tool that, the, of, of uh, global value chains and, and big economic players, but small players, micro entrepreneurs, small business people uh, can also get access uh, to the benefits that derive from globalization. And, you know, one of the ways we do that is to look at um, barriers to trade uh, and barriers to the movement of goods around the world and how we can simplify uh, the flow of goods and, and things around the world. But before we can ship the goods, we actually have to help people sell their goods. Uh, and I'm reminded of a, of a colleague of mine at a, who works for a, probably the largest retailer in the world, who I won't name here, uh, but uh, is headquartered in Arkansas. Uh, and she has worked for many years in emerging markets and with women entrepreneurs in emerging markets. So think, if you will, you know, she's, she did projects, uh, quite a few projects in sub-Saharan Africa. And when she shared her experience with me, and an experience I've heard from a lot of other organizations as well, they say, you know, we can go and work with small business owners who are women uh, and help them develop their businesses, and we do that. We work with them on advising them on, say, how to, how to design handicrafts, because a lot of people work in the handicraft industry, how to design products for the market, how to do the colors right, how to do the design so they have market appeal, how to understand your market better. But when it gets down to it, I can't buy their products because they can't uh, manufacture 20,000 of an item that I need in order to sell it through my chain. So we're left at the end of the program with a big question mark. We've equipped people to take advantage of commerce, but we haven't, we haven't cracked the nut about how they can sell into larger markets. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about d democratizing opportunity. How do we get these small entrepreneurs to a place where they can enter a large market? Well, for us, uh, and more and more I, people, I think, the digital economy is a potential answer for that. Uh, that if you think of online platforms like Etsy, all of a sudden, this person has an ability, an opportunity to, to market her goods at a smaller volume to which she can produce and to customers potentially around the world. But in order for her to do that, there are several barriers that are still in her way that keep her out of the global economy. The most basic of which is answering the question of, of internet infrastructure. Can she actually get access to the internet? The second would be the question of internet literacy. Okay, she's, she's, she's got access to the internet. She's got, she's got herself a, a computer and a, and a connection, but does she know how to actually market online? Can she access information? Can she do those things? The third is, is much more familiar to us at SIPE who have dealt with the issues of informality for many years. Uh, 
But it's basic issues like, what is your identity? Now, are, uh, can, you, can you have an e-signature in, in the case of, 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 of digital data and digital trade? Uh, and then finally, the big question mark is can, when you actually have the transaction, can you exchange money? You know, you think about it, what do you need to exchange funds on the internet with? Well, you need some sort of an account, which means you have to exist as a person. You have, someone had to register your birth uh, to start off with, and that's still a very basic issue. But more importantly, do you have a bank account? Do you have some way to attach the transaction you're going to take, undertake to, to uh, the data economy? And for a lot of people, that remains a huge barrier. I'm reminded of a, of a, of a company I, I met in, in Senegal a few months ago. And they're one of Senegal's fastest growing tech businesses. And what they do is they convert people's cash, essentially, into the cashless transaction that needs to occur. So if I wanted to buy something, I would go to this company with my handful of cash. I would go on the internet with them. They would make the transaction for me. I hand them my cash. And then they arrange to have that good shipped to their office in Dakar from anywhere in the world. They take care of that transaction for you. So there, there are ways that people are trying to make this system work. But if we really want to reach the true potential of that, we have to start un, unpacking this issue of access, uh, access to, to a cashless economy. So like, w like the questions of informality, in which we say, you know, the, the real goal of, of moving people from an informal institution to a formal institution is to allow people to do business with a stranger because they have the support of banks and courts and all sorts of things in case something goes wrong. We say the same thing about uh, e-commerce. We have to make it possible for individuals to do business with a stranger over the internet. And so if we think about that, the biggest barriers that we have identified and that this report actually, hold it up for you here, has identified and is trying to address are four key areas, and we're going to hear from our panel today about more, more of their work in these areas, but four key areas uh, that we're identifying as barriers uh, that, that require more work both at the global level but also at the local level because we can have global standards, but we need to make sure that, that those can be then translated to the local standards. Consumer protection is the first one. Data protection is the second one. Cyber security is the third area. And then finally, electronic transaction itself. So those things I mentioned earlier about having an e-signature uh, and, um, and uh, a cashless way to make uh, e-payments. <coughs> now, at SIP, we work with business communities around the world on these issues, on a wide variety <coughs> of issues. And what we've learned in all this work is that when you're trying to create the environment for a formal economy, an environment for these types of transactions to occur with some predictability and assurance, public-private dialogue becomes key to all of this because policymakers have to make the rules eventually. But one of the weakest links that we find is the business community itself, especially if you're a smaller, medium, or micro-entrepreneur. Who's going to represent your interests and your voice? Do they understand the issues? Can they understand the complexity of what we're talking about? If you think about the digital debate, it's still happening in a thousand places around the world. Uh, there's still no grand consensus on, on a lot of these issues. So a lot of these debates have to happen at the local level. And, we have to, and we've realized that the weakest link is the business associations themselves. So the goal of this, of this program that we're, we're introducing today is to help equip the private sector, and in particular the institutions that represent the private sector, with, with the information and the strategies they need and the understanding they need to help tackle these issues when they come into dialogue with policymakers. It also helps in the sense that we need to create common language. There are a lot of players in this space, business and policymakers are two of them, but the third is civil society. And often when we're talking about complex policy debates, we have to make sure we're using the same words and the same understandings for everything we talk about, or you waste a lot of time. Uh, so one of the goals of this booklet is really to make sure that when we enter into a debate, we're all speaking the same language. So today's panel, uh, is, is established or set up today to help walk us through these issues uh, and to have a, a, a discussion about 
uh, about this program. They're going to review the publication and some of the major recommendations within it. And then they're going to talk about the global challenges of trying to implement these regulations uh, and these recommendations that we put forth. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're in a global debate over norms and values. You know, we talk a lot about China, for instance. Uh, and what's going on in China with AI and data and a lot of other issues. That's a completely different approach to technology issues than we have been, that, than we're used to in our world. How do we square those? And then finally, as with all good policy, we have to talk about the barriers to implementation. It's one thing to draft good policy, it's another thing to try and implement it. So we've got some very smart people around the table, uh, much smarter than I when it comes to dealing with tech issues. I'm the, I'm the first one to admit that my 17-year-old my, my probably could, could do a lot better job than I could in, in discussing these issues. Uh, but we've got learned people here who are going to share with you their viewpoints. One of them I'm gonna, who I'm going to hand over to is, is Luisa Tomar who is our own global program officer who's been responsible for working with New Markets Lab on this issue. Uh, and thankfully, um, younger and smarter than me uh, on these issues. And I'm going to hand it over to Louisa to thank take you. everything over. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to our panel. And um, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we really appreciate your comments and setting up this panel for us. And thank you to all of you for joining us this morning. Um, as Andrew mentioned, I'm Luisa Tomar. I'm a program officer on the global team. And we set out to address these complex digital economy topics for our traditional partners, so business associations, chambers of commerce, and economic think tanks. So when we first got together with New Markets Lab to try to figure out how do we create a guide that um, will bring policymakers and the private sector and really civil society together with a common language to address these issues, where do we start? And so what we started with was a survey of our partners. And we quickly identified that they were still sort of learning these topics and what their members, so that may be entrepreneurs to mid-sized firms, what their concerns were. And that's where we selected these topics. And one thing we wanted to make sure in this guide is that we addressed things like e-signature laws, which um, you know over 100 countries still don't have e-signature laws, which may sound shocking to us, but um, that can be a huge barrier to online transactions, um, to things that are much more complicated, like cybersecurity. Um, so we wanted a full spectrum, and we wanted to make sure that uh, all of our partners could find something in this guidebook that would be informative and helpful as they start to build advocacy strategies around these topics. Um, I'd like to thank my panel for joining us this morning. Um, I'm joined by Katrin Coleman, the president um, and founder of New Markets Lab, who was, you know, the um, the brains behind this, this guidebook um, and her team of attorneys working around the globe to look at different um, legal frameworks, uh, regulatory structures, um, implementation enforcement considerations across the topic. So after I introduce the panel, I'll turn it over to Katrin to talk a bit more about the process and what they learned in researching these topics with us. Um, we're also joined by Terrence Chu of the Empower Financing. Um, so I'll turn to him to talk a bit more about um, his company. Um, he's the general counsel and chief compliance officer there. We're also joined by John Collins of FS Vector, which is supporting um, fintech startups in the US and also comes with um, a policy background from Coinbase. And we're also joined by um, Jacqueline Musidwa of, um, on the board of the International Center for Trade and Sustainable Development and um, a cybersecurity fellow at New, um, New America Foundation. So thank you all for joining us. And I'll turn it over to Katrin to talk a bit about the process. And then we'll jump into the panel questions. OK. Let's see. Can you hear me OK if I? sit back and speak, I'll scoot up a little bit. Um, thank you so much, Louisa. Thank you, Andrew and, and Sype, um, for hosting this today and for being such a great partner in this endeavor. And 
Thanks also to this fantastic panel. I'm really excited about the discussion that we're going to have. I thought I would just set the stage a little bit by first introducing my organization and this legal guide um, and, and how we came to do this. Um, so so we, my organization is called the New Markets Lab. As you've heard, we are, I would say in shorthand, a law and development center. Um, but our mission is really to make the regulatory environment more accessible, more transparent, and to think about the regulatory environment in a way that really facilitates market growth from the, really from the most fundamental level up, instead of top down, which I think um, is the way that sometimes we approach policy issues. I've lived and worked in Washington, D.C. for most of my career. I used to be a trade negotiator and was a lawyer in private practice before that. And I think sometimes when we approach these big policy issues, we tend to think first from the government level, then going down. And with an issue like this in particular, we have to reverse our thinking. We have to really think about who's using the system and what challenges are they encountering. And that was, I think, one of the things that made this particular guide. So we've done a series of guides through the New Markets Lab. It's one of our sort of signature tools that we've put together, our legal guides, because often the legal and regulatory environment is very complex. And you know, we spend, I spend a lot of my time traveling, probably you know, sometimes up to half of the year overseas in the markets that we're working in. We work throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, we've worked in India, we've worked in China just listening to people talk about their experiences with the legal environment, often without even mentioning the word law, just listening to what people have to say about their day-to-day -day experiences navigating the system. And we've done these guides for entrepreneurs, we've done them for women entrepreneurs, we've done them on very technical topics like regulation of seed, which I will not talk about today, I promise. Um, but this one was really interesting. Now. One thing that I want to say actually before is to thank my team and two of our senior fellows, Anna and Megan, who worked closely on the guides. You'll, you'll see them listed um, as the authors of the guide are here. We had another one of our senior fellows, Meng Yiwang, who is not here, but is, is based in China. And one of the things that was interesting to us was that because this is such a global issue that's really being approached very differently by different countries, we had to take a global approach. Now, fortunately, that's the way we're structured and that's the way we like to do our work, but it was really in particularly interesting with this guide because we had certain assumptions, I think, even you know, as international lawyers going into this about how certain elements of, this, of the kind of international frameworks or the regional or even local frameworks worked. And through our team, we were able to pinpoint, well, actually, this is how things work, particularly in East Africa or in China which is a big question, I think, and one that Andrew highlighted, or in Latin America, where there have been some innovations in this area that are different. And so that, I thought, was really interesting, too, to bring in these different perspectives. And I think that's really important as we continue to talk about these topics, because not every country is going to approach these things the same way, nor should they. And not every country is going to do what the US or EU is doing right now on these topics, nor should they. So that was one thing. I think another thing was the partnership with SIPE that really made this unique. And because of SIPE's focus on really working with the business community, and we tend to try to work also very closely with the business community through all of our work, but with SIPE, I think having this particular <coughs> focus on advocacy and public-private dialogue, it really made us think carefully about how could we create a tool that was useful in an area of law that is really very underdeveloped or undeveloped in some cases, or at the very early stages with these complicated technological questions behind it, how could we try to tailor something that would be useful for SIPE's target audience? And I think it, it made all of us like really have to take about you know 300 steps back from a very technical approach, which is what lawyers are known for, to something that was more practical. And so we tried very hard to do that. I'm sure there are still spots where we needed to do more. But I think this was also the beginning of a process. And typically, you know, when we do tools like this or we do a regulatory diagnostic or we do some kind of a, a project or program to work on these issues, it's a long process. Law is an evolving thing. It's not just something that gets passed on a piece of paper and then the world changes. It is a whole process. And I think Andrew pointed out that implementation is really important. That is <coughs> critical, but you have to think about where some of those challenges might arise in implementing a law before you even pass the law. Because otherwise, then you wind up with something that doesn't work well. And so 
these were the types of things that we were really trying to kind of put out in front as we developed this guide. You know, how could we respond to some of the needs of the private sector, particularly very small companies, I think, as Andrew was pointing out, very small enterprises. How could we think about what policymakers <coughs> might be anticipating? I think here the technology is by far outstripping the law. And I think for policymakers, that is a bit of a terrifying proposition. You know, how do you keep up with that? And how do you, what, where do you prioritize? And how do you regulate? Um, and then how do some of the other actors in this, you know, play a role? I teach law school as well, and one of the things that I do with my students is to go through these different rules and try to approach questions from different perspectives. And it really helps to think about the law differently, and I think we really try to do that with this guide. So, um, but, you know, I think that this is probably going to continue to happen. I think that with the way that the global economy is becoming more integrated and with the role that technology is playing in the market, I think we're going to have more and more of these questions. And so hopefully together we can figure out a bit how we should approach some of these things. It was, this is not meant to be prescriptive. We are not coming out here saying, here is the model. This is what everyone should follow. We really were just trying to pull as many examples as we could and kind of come up with some common ways some common themes maybe in ways that we might approach some of these questions. So I'll go into the detail more in these four areas that we covered, consumer protection, data protection, e-payments, e-signatures, which we kind of treated um, as electronic transactions, and then cybersecurity, which in any one of those, of course, is a big, big area. And you know, with, I think, our panel, we can kind of dive more deeply into some of them. But I think maybe I will leave it at that, mm -hmm. and then we can kind of go into some of the topics in a little bit more depth. But you know, again, hopefully you'll have some feedback for us, too, because we really thought of this as a, a bit of a you know, sort of uncharted territory and one that we wanted to take on, because it's such an important set of issues um, that are really evolving very rapidly. So thanks again, Lisa. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Katrin. Um, you know, one point that Andrew made that made me think of the process we just went through. I was in Nairobi last month for a launch there, and um, I met the graphic designer who did the guidebook for us. So we used Upwork, which is, you know, a digital platform that you can find designers and other type of um, freelancers from all over the globe, and we happened to hire someone in Nairobi and then have the opportunity to go there to present the guide and also meet um, the person who uh, did the designing for us. Um, and another point that um, Katrin brought up that um, reminds me of one of the things we that was discussed um, in Nairobi on this panel was this idea of um, sort of whether the enforcement of laws makes sense, or the, the laws as drafted and their enforcement um, reflect the needs. So we had um, a representative of the telecommunications industry and we had a representative of the civil society and they were discussing their cybersecurity law that's there and currently um, Article 19, a civil society organization is suing the government over this law because it infringes on freedom of expression online. And interestingly, the private sector, the telecommunications industry, they're frustrated because they can't rely on this law to be enforced because it's caught up in the courts. So I think there are many interesting and complex issues related to this, and certainly with cybersecurity, we have Jacqueline here um, to discuss the topics. But I think, you know, we're seeing different approaches to these different issues um, depending on the countries and depending on the regions. And as Katra mentioned, this guide is not prescriptive. I think, especially in the US, we are still figuring out how we're regulating these issues here to a large extent. Um, and even seeing how the EU's general data protection regulation is going to be um, unrolled is still a question and whether other countries and regions will adopt it. Um, so thank you all for joining us and um, thank you for the explanation, Katrin. And I'll now um, turn to Terrence to talk a little bit about Empower Financing um, and a bit about maybe how regulation has changed from your background with commercial banking to what you're seeing now related to perhaps data protection and other issues in the finance sector. Sure. <clears throat> thank you, Louisa. So, Hi everyone, good morning. Um, I'm the General Counsel and Chief Compliance Officer for Empower. We are a student lender with a particular niche, uh, 
we focus on lending to international students studying in the U.S., which is right now a completely unserved market. Uh, I think the latest uh, figures as of 2015 had something like 1.3 million foreign students. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so we focus on lending to it what we regard as a completely underserved market given the events of 9-11, given the focus on uh, anti-money laundering, anti-terrorism financing, a whole bunch of regulations which I won't bore you with have come in that make uh, the profitability or likelihood that commercial organizations will lend the, to this particular population very difficult. And that's mainly because they don't have the traditional documentation that we as, let's say, U.S. citizens routinely have access to. We have social security numbers, we have driver's licenses, we have passports, we have other indicia that uh, are deemed reliable that uh, the commercial organizations, mainly the banks in this particular space, uh, rely on to prove who you are and then you proceed your, your reward for having all that, doc of that documentation is you get to fill out long applications and go through a very uh, interesting credit screening process. So uh, given that fact and the fact that uh, we believe as an institution that socioeconomic mobility is meant to be borderless and that we are focusing on not products per se, but another kind of product, human capital, right? And we believe that that will help the country and the global uh, economy because we understand that a lot of our students will eventually return to their native countries to try to bring those skills that they've learned here over there and apply those learnings in an effort to better their countries and their societies. So uh, I am, I guess we are the uh, business representative on the panel, uh, and I can speak to you from a very uh, pointed business perspective because uh, I will wanted to thank both Katrin and Luisa and their organizations because they, they focus on an area that I don't have time to focus on, right? I have to deal with the day-to-day, -day, what's happening with my operations department, what's happening with my IT folks, mm -hmm. people that we're hiring, are they passing their, you know, their documentation checks? I don't have time to worry, to focus a lot of my attention on policy and practice. Uh, we outsource our lobbying to, to a large degree. We deal with issues as they come up, but we're not proactive about it because we're an organization of 30 people right now, and we simply don't have time, right? We, we are strictly focused on becoming large enough to be one of the big players eventually, to be profitable, and to take our uh, offerings uh, both nationally and hopefully internationally at some point. Uh, of all the people in your organization, I get to think about these things. <laughs> so I get to think about GDPR, cybersecurity, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, so that's just a brief introduction, uh, and I guess I'll defer it back to you so we can continue with your discussion. Great. Thank you, Terrence. Um, yes, we will definitely ask you many questions on the issues you're seeing. Um, I wanted to turn now to John, if you could introduce yourself a bit, um, who you're working with at FS Vector, and perhaps um, some insights you might have on what you're seeing from the startup community and their sort of legal and regulatory um, concerns mm -hmm. at this time. Okay. Uh, I'm John Collins. Uh, I'm a partner at FS Vector. We're an advisory firm uh, with offices in Boston and, and here in Washington, D.C. And we work with fintech companies, uh, banks, and banks that want to work with fintech companies, mostly around compliance and um, political and regulatory risk and strategy, especially with companies who have <coughs> what I would say probably new and innovative business models and they want to figure out how to get to market 
in a safe uh, and efficient efficient way. And I just wanted to thank um, you know both Louisa and Katrin for for the work you guys did. You know, in my own work as all as well as you know with the companies that we deal with and you know policymakers. It's very difficult even for people that have been in financial services, for instance, for decades to keep track of all of the new developments, all of the new buzzwords, frankly. Um, so just having a taxonomy such as this is, is really positive. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, what we do at Vector is, is work with companies. Everyone, our, I think our smallest client is a three-person shop right now that's trying to build out a compliance program um, for, a, for and it's a payments company to, um, to large institutions, l large scale mid-growth um, companies. So. Um, and the work we do is predominantly in the U.S., but um, my former uh, career was at a company called Coinbase, uh, which is a digital currency company, Bitcoin company, um, that's now operating worldwide. Uh, but at the time I was there, we were trying to operate worldwide. So trying to have those conversations with everyone from state regulators mm -hmm. to international regulators, it's, it's, um, it, can be, it can be difficult conversations at time, especially when you're trying to explain new concepts and new technologies. Um, but yeah, that's the work that, that I focus on. Um, and again, very, very excited to be here for the conversation. Great. Thank you. Um, and Jacqueline, mm -hmm. I'll turn to you to speak a bit about your work um, at New America and then, um, of course, sort of any insights you might have from your, your uh, participation on the board at ICTSD. Good morning. Um, pardon me. I'm recovering from an awful, awful cold. So in case you can't hear me, just um, wave and I'll try to speak louder. Um, I come here today in several capacities. One is as a board member of ICTSD, um, and I would, on behalf of ICTSD, thank Sype for the introduction. Um, ICTSD is a think and do tank that's based in Geneva and that focuses on sustainable development as it relates to trade and also um, as we are starting to experience new issues like the digital economy, helping the Geneva trade community, but also the global community that is dealing with trade to try to understand what a legal framework might look like and how that legal framework might eventually feed into the WTO uh, framework on trade. Uh, my other kind of hat today is um, as a new, a new America Cybersecurity Policy Fellow, and for anyone interested in cybersecurity, it's an interesting fellowship that brings together people that are working on different aspects of policy to really start to analyze what's happening across the globe. Um, and one area that I'm especially excited about is their goal to diversify what cybersecurity looks like, to move it um, from the stereotypical <coughs> view of it being the domain of a white male to it being the domain of anyone who wants to be a cybersecurity expert. Touching on the issue of cybersecurity, I'll go to kind of my third hat, which is as the head of financial sector deepening Uganda. And that is a financial market development um, firm that is funded by Gates Foundation and the UK government. And the primary goal is to improve the finance sector in Uganda. There are eight FSDs across the African continent, and so a lot of the experiences that I'll be sharing today will actually be from an African continental view and some of the challenges that have been mentioned. I'm um, just trying to share kind of everyday experiences that I have trying to get legislation across and the fact that it's not easy, it takes a lot of time, and you do have to kind of nudge and push um, people within parliament, people within government to come on board to adopt agendas like, you know, the digital economy and the legislation of it when they don't know what it means. Um, and that tends to be quite difficult. There's also kind of a current trend that we're seeing where there's a lot of suspicion, as was previously mentioned, um, where on the one hand you're trying to advocate for small businesses, but government is seeing people that might eventually threaten them through the use of social media. And so balancing those tends to be quite <coughs> difficult. Um, I think another thing on the Uganda level is really that of engagement. How do you engage with a micro-entrepreneur? Micro-entrepreneur being a woman who's selling tomatoes to a man who's riding a motorcycle and bringing the concerns that they have to parliament and anyone else 
but more importantly for a country like um, Uganda that's increasing its production of chia seeds, how do you get chia seeds from the fields there to markets abroad? Um, and make sure that once again, they're able to advocate on their own behalf to government and also make sure that they can sell through online platforms. I think the last thing we've heard a bit about um, enforcement and one of the things I think that it's hard for me as a lawyer that has drafted legislation is seeing the legislation go through, um, it being assented by the respective president or prime minister and then nothing really happening because the tools for enforcement and the cost of enforcement is way too difficult and so I think as we think through these issues I think it's great that globally we're starting to think of what a global framework might look like but when it goes to local enforcement especially local enforcement in least developed countries I think there is a challenge and I think we need to be realistic about what we expect of certain countries and we also need to figure out what to do when we say, you know, here is GDPR and it applies, and what it really means across the board for countries where the people that are using a particular service might consent without fully understanding what that consent means. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, all three of you have your um, feet in the financial sector. So I'm curious, in the guidebook, when we talk about e-payments, we sort of uh, cover a banking and a non-banking model. And I think many of us here know it's very easy to uh, pay our friends back, family members, um, through different types of apps. But when we want to send money abroad, it looks very different. So when we're thinking about international financing opportunities, um, you know, in different countries, e-payments and sort of how that intersects with um, banking regulations, what are some of the things that the private sector, so that could be the finance community, or even business that are looking for alternative financing opportunities, be thinking about in terms of regulation? And, you know, one uh, piece of news recently um, is that the Central Bank of Malawi recently um, obligated that all businesses there have an e-payment option. Um, so we can see sort of laws come in quickly and now it will be up to every size company, even very small and micro size companies, um, to implement an e-payment structure. So I'm just curious what you're seeing in that regulatory space um, and whether you think there is a need for maybe a, an international perspective um, and how that kind of backs up against the compliance anti-money laundering obligations. So, um, I'll start with you, Catherine, and then... <laughs> I'll give everyone else a little bit more time to think about the question. And maybe I can highlight a couple of the things that we had in the guide, and then we can pivot off of that to talk about some of these things that are happening. I, I think e-payments and e-signatures, again, we kind of treated them a little bit in tandem. But one of the things that's so interesting for me is that this is kind of rethinking a little bit how we think about contracts and how we think about agreements between parties. and. You know, again, as a lawyer, I think we're taught to think of a contract as, you know, a, a document, a piece of paper that you have where you have two people sitting down and showing some kind of, you know, agreement and then signing something. And electronically, then it challenges all of those notions because you have people who have never even met who are entering into contracts and they are giving their assent through digital means rather than through some kind of, you know, a, trans a, a, a recorded signature where somebody else is sitting there on the other side of the table. And I think this gives rise to a whole host of questions, particularly as we get into some of these areas too, like blockchain, I think, and some of the work that you've done on Bitcoin. I, it's been fascinating for me to dive a little bit deeper into that. I'm on an advisory board for a, a blockchain initiative called BlockDrop, which is trying to make the legal aspect of blockchain more accessible because, again, you've got technology that's by, you know, outstripping the legal side. And, um, but it does mean that we have to rethink a little bit what a contract is and what a contract looks like and, and how do you make sure that there really is agreement? How do you make sure that both sides, I think Jacqueline just pointed this out, you know, that mm -hmm. they know what they're agreeing to, mm -hmm. that there really is consent. And I, so I think that, you know, I don't, I will not say that all of the answers seem to be out there, but I think some of these questions are really important to consider. And I think your example, Louisa, of Malawi 
requiring this is also an example too of something where perhaps the government you know might be thinking that this is a good idea to do but then is doing something that's outside of the capacity of the local you know private sector and local individuals I think to to really comply with so I, I there are a lot of things that we could talk about here I think on the whole e-payment side I guess I would say you know we've we've also done some work at New Markets Lab on financial services regulation and of course traditional financial services are very heavily regulated um, but I think that some of what we're talking about here goes outside of that realm of traditional bank delivered financial services and so it puts it into the space where we're almost in a bit of a regulatory vacuum, or maybe we don't know what the regulatory situation looks like or whether the rules apply the same way or not. And there's this fascinating concept, I think, this thing that the UK, and I'd be curious to see whether any of you have had experiences with this, but the UK has tried called a regulatory sandbox, yeah. which I think just sounds fascinating too. <laughs> but it's the idea that basically is that the regulators <laughs> and the companies will kind of get into the sandbox and, and agree that like the rules don't necessarily apply while you're trying to sort through what exactly that what exactly the service looks like and maybe you know what the what the regulatory implications are it's an interesting idea right because i think that typically again with law and regulation there's this idea that you have something out there that applies to you or doesn't apply to you and you should know what it is i think you guys both pointed out too that you know for the companies that are operating in this space, you know, there's so much going on and you don't necessarily always have the time. And you are, I think, examples of very, you know, savvy, you, you know, but, but imagine, I think, for many companies where they don't have legal representation, they don't have anyone who's doing this kind of work for them, just even knowing what might apply to you, I think, is a, is a big hurdle sometimes and a big question mark. Um, but I think that we have this idea that you should know that first and then, you know, take action and perhaps then the government enforces something if there's a problem. I, I like this idea, though, of the government or, or a government regulator, perhaps, and a business kind of experimenting together to see what might serve the needs of the market and then how the regulatory system should fit with that. And I think that's basically what the regulatory sandbox idea is. Um, Maybe it also appeals to me because I have kids. I'm like, I can understand a sandbox <laughs> concept. But I think it's a really interesting idea. It's a different way of thinking about how to regulate. And maybe is something that should really enter into an area like this with such technological applications, but maybe other areas as well. Um, so I would be curious as to whether you have, you know, experience with some of those things. And I think you asked the question, too, of, you know, how does this kind of the traditional financial services and the non-traditional financial services, how do they sort of balance out? Maybe we can come back to some of the international initiatives here, because, again, I think there's some interesting things happening, but definitely some gaps, too. But maybe <coughs> it's a good point to turn back to all of you now that you've had a bit of time to reflect and give your thoughts. Jacqueline, please. Um, on the issue of sandboxes, so we have been engaging with, uh, so in Uganda, if you are a fintech and you would like to uh, bring your product to market, you need to get authorization from the Bank of Uganda, which is a central bank. And we've noticed over the past three to five years that fintechs will come and they'll bring really interesting financial innovations and the central bank wouldn't really know what to do with them because what they were trying to do was outside the rules that had already been set by Bank of Uganda. So after a lot of complaining in the market and after the creation of a FinTech association, um, we finally managed to engage um, Bank of Uganda and Bank of Uganda and the Insurance Regulatory Authority have both agreed to work with us on a sandbox. That's fantastic. And from their perspective, it's we will work with a given number of innovators. We will monitor what they're doing, make sure that there are no negative effects on consumers, make sure that c the consumers do know that it's an experiment of sorts and use that as the basis for whether they can actually later fully release their products to market. I think it's really progressive and I'm really excited that after a lot of engagement, they actually have agreed. Now, the flip side of the sandbox that I'm hearing from other regulators around the continent is, well, if you have a problem with what our rules are, why don't you just come and ask and get a no objection? And so I think when it comes to the terminology, there are a lot of central banks that are also a bit cautious 
about bringing in mm -hmm. new terminology and what seem to be new ideas, but what have actually been in place before. So for instance, if you go to Zambia with mm -hmm. a new innovation, you will go to the central bank, they will review it. And if it's something that they have concerns about, they'll tell you what those concerns are, and they will give you the parameters within which to operate. And so from that perspective, it's we don't need to create something new. It's just come talk to us and engage with us. But I think a problem that I've noticed kind of from my time in legal practice is a lot of companies and innovators are really just scared of the authorities. Yeah. It's hard to get through to central banks, I understand that. It's hard to sometimes explain new things to them in a way that they understand and are comfortable with because their immediate reaction is no, mm -hmm. it's bad for the mm -hmm. market, <coughs> uh, it'll be detrimental to customers. But I think what's needed from an entrepreneur innovation perspective is really how do you best engage with a regulator to make them feel yeah, comfortable yeah. with the fact that you know what you're doing, yes, might have negative consequences, but you eventually will um, best serve the market in whatever ways you uh, plan to. So I think it, I thought it was important just to highlight yeah. that there is a lot that regulators already have on the books and it's really just a matter of kind of better engaging them. Yeah. But for the new regulators, I mean, Uganda is taking this first step. The Capital Markets Authority in Kenya um, also has a sandbox. Sierra Leone's central bank has a sandbox. So there's some interesting developments across the continent that I'm pretty excited about. That's tremendously Fantastic. exciting. That would be a great case study, too, I think, to really follow that from the beginning to... You know, I think that would be, we should talk about that more because <laughs> I think some of this is so new too. And it's, I love this idea of creating a safe space where you can kind of work through some of it. And it's not that, you know, you're talking about not complying with regulations. It's just trying to make sure everybody understands what applies and what doesn't and what the implications are. And it seems like some of these principles that we have in the guide of really how to balance different interests and different roles come out in a context like this. So okay. it's exciting. Absolutely. Sorry, the example. only caution I have is everyone gets excited about, you know, the UK and Asia yeah. examples. And I think what we're finding in the Ugandan case is we're looking at everything, but we're actually just starting from scratch with a Ugandan model. Mm -hmm. It's a bit too hard yeah. to copy models that are yeah. that far developed. Yeah. And we're just finding it easier to go, okay, what works within the parameters yeah. of the laws that we already have on the books? And for what yeah. isn't in place, um, how do we just start to create it rather than looking at other systems, which I also think is great yeah. progress because in times past, what has happened a lot across the continent is we've cut and pasted laws from around the world <laughs> right. and it just hasn't worked in implementation right. and that's where we've gone wrong. And so now I think that it's great that we do have this consciousness of saying, you know what, um, what we don't have, we will develop over time. It may take a lot of time to develop, but Let's start with what. Let's start with the frameworks we do have, because there is a lot that is possible. And for the innovations that we have in our markets, which are mostly based off mobile money, yeah. we do have the capacity That's to great. do that now. Yeah. Makes so much sense. Um, John, can you speak a bit to what you're seeing here in the U.S. and whether you think perhaps there is space for a regulatory sandbox here? Um, yeah, and, and actually I'll, I'll touch on first because it, it's fascinating what's going on in Uganda. I've, I've followed sandboxes in here in the United States and as well as in Europe and a bit in Asia. But I wanted to kind of go back to, I think, before I touch on that, the mm -hmm. earlier conversation around the harmonization or rationalization of, mm -hmm. you know, global standards. And, you know, in, in financial services, to oversimplify it, you know, financial regulators are predominantly concerned with two things. One is just making sure the financial system isn't used for uh, criminal purposes. Right. Um, and the second is making sure the financial system doesn't collapse. Uh, so, you know, they and and because the financial service system is as old as it is and is as regulated as it is, we do have a number of pretty well organized international bodies that work on those issues. You have the Basel Committee, uh, you have um, FATF, uh, which mm -hmm. works on AML KYC issues. But to go to Jacqueline's point, I think during your opening, those are represented by yeah. particular markets and particular yeah. interests. Yeah. Um, Uganda is not one of them, right? It's, yeah. it's France, it's the US, it's the UK. And so how do we think, and I don't have the answer, uh, but, but how do we think about um, 
rationalizing these new entrants, these new markets that, that want to be a part of the, um, the system so that they can be, uh, because it's in the interest of uh, industry to have clarity and to be able to, to connect and plug in. And it's also in the interest of regulators to have mm -hmm. consistency so they can do their job correctly. Um, on the sandbox piece, you know, sandboxes are a really interesting construct that started in the UK. And really where they came from is um, if you look at technology and how it's disrupted various industries, it started with the unregulated ones first, and now it's moved on to the regulated ones. And again, financial services is probably the highest regulated other than maybe air transport. Um, <laughs> but um, so what, what Sandbox is aimed to do is because um, financial regulators and regulation is so rigid and established, it aimed to um, uh, get rid of the tension between innovation <coughs> and regulation yeah. by providing a, a, a space where that tension could be relieved, where people could experiment um, and try, uh, you know, new new um, applications with live people, with real people. Because you know, if you have a photo sharing app and you throw it on the internet, you can do a B testing. If it doesn't work or mm. something bad happens, who cares? You know, if you're yeah. handling someone's money or payments and their livelihood, that's a big deal. Mm. So. Um, you know, that's where the concept started. And, you know, the UK, I think, has been doing it for about four years now. And, you know, they've had some successful tests and they've had, um, um, you know, some people that have, have done live testing. But, you know, they actually put out a lessons learned report maybe a year or two ago. And what they found was that, among other things, what it really resulted in was, A, um, it provided uh, a lot more investment for companies that got into these sandboxes because it was sort of a good housekeeping seal of approval that gave investors confidence in the businesses. And especially in, in, in this industry, having some regulators on your side is always a good thing. Um, and then the second piece is that, you know, a lot of companies weren't testing. They just wanted, as you were talking about, in interaction with the regulators. They wanted a two-way mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nice if you can raise like $100 million from Andreessen Horowitz and buy fancy lawyers, um, which is my company did, but but you can, it's, it's also for a company that doesn't have $100 million, um, you know, they don't want to spend whatever capital they do on lawyers you know, or, or compliance <laughs> professionals. So being able to get that free <laughs> advice is really positive, right? Um, so that's one of the things that came from that. In the U.S., we, we have a very fragmented financial regulatory system, both at the federal level and at the state level. You know, if you're a fintech company, you're a financial services um, company that's delivering financial services through technology, um, you are probably regulated not only at the federal level, but in every single state that you want to operate in. Uh, some of those states have similar rules and, and, and requirements. Some don't. Um, but it's, you know, you're, you're dealing with I think probably 60 plus different regulators. Um, that makes it really tough and really, really expensive. Um, what you've seen is is a few states popping up with um, their own sandboxes. Uh, Arizona, chief mm. among them. Actually, the guy who put together Arizona's sandbox is now the, I'm going to get the title wrong, but he's ba basically heading up uh, innovation at what is now the BCF. PB. I can't keep track. <laughs> Formerly the CFPB, whatever we're calling it now. Um, but uh, and so, so you're, you're seeing states do that, and you're you're also seeing the the financial regulators here in the United States pop up with innovation offices. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know whether or not they're going to be able to, to come together. I think they're they're trying, um, but it's difficult to do a sandbox in the U.S. just because. You know, if the CFTC says that something's okay, that doesn't mean um, mm -hmm. the OCC is going to say it's okay, or the SEC is going to say mm -hmm. it's okay, or the state of Delaware, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, but I think just having these conversations, you know, the fact that now the SEC, the CFTC, all of these various, the OCC, Treasury, they have people that are innovation officers that, that companies can go to, that industry can go mm -hmm. to. Um, that's a really, really positive development that even just a few years ago, I don't think there was um, the comfort in that sort of two-way mm -hmm. dialogue. I think mm -hmm. it was much more adversarial or, or frankly just a black box of, of what to do and who to talk to. So that's, that's been a very positive outcome. Great, thank you. I mean, this brings up a lot of questions about consumer protection, which is something we also covered in the guide. Um, and we focused on online dispute resolution as one of the key areas where um, countries transitioning to a more digital economy um, would have an opportunity to, you know, uh, handle disputes online and um, 
you know, be sure that, you know, if they were to purchase something and the, the good didn't arrive, that they would have a mechanism to, to deal with that. Um, so I'm just wondering, Terrence, if you can speak to sort of how in, um, in Empower and what you're doing, um, consumer protection, that balance between, um, you know, the students you're working with, the, the financing component of it, um, and how you view consumer protection within the, the financing uh, community. Sure. Um, I'd like, if I can, just to offer one comment on the regulatory mm -hmm. sandbox. Sure. So I'll give you a practitioner's perspective. Right? Um, so we are regulated by the CFPB, the BCF, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and they have a program called Project Catalyst, and mm -hmm. that is their version of the regulatory sandbox. So not getting into whether it works or not, I'll leave that to for other people to discuss. I can tell you some of the considerations we went through because we thought about using Project Catalyst to accomplish that thing, that very thing that you talked about. So you've already mentioned the upsides, mm -hmm. but the downsides are considerable as well, right? So uh, you've always heard that old saying, it's better to ask for forgiveness yeah, than ask right. for yeah. permission, yeah. right? Yeah. So if you are in an industry with a groundbreaking concept or product, uh, the last thing you want to do is let your product get strangled in the crib. Yeah. So if you think about Uber, for example, right, they just went out right. and did it, right. created a market. So when the inevitable regulation came in, there was a strong backing for the service. Whether you think it's correct or not is yeah. not the point of the discussion. But what they did is they created a market that then protected them to some degree from some of the more, I would describe as onerous yeah. uh, regulatory yeah attempts, yeah, right? Yeah. So one of the downsides of using a project catalyst is if the regulators say no, then right. what do you do? Yeah, right? true. Because now you have a regulator who says, oh no, you cannot do that. That's true. Right. And PACE is another example, right, mm -hmm. where you've Absolutely. got a technology. So there are these practical considerations about using a regulatory sandbox. A lot of it depends on the good faith that you believe is with yeah. the people who are implementing yeah. the sandbox. Yeah. Uh, we have other concerns about confidentiality, mm -hmm. trade secret mm -hmm. protection, because mm -hmm. we're talking, we believe, our crown jewels, right? To, right? So, for example, one of the things we thought about taking to Project Catalyst was a revolutionary credit algorithm. Well, you have to show them what the algorithm is. You have to right. tell them how it works. Yeah. You know, that'd be like Coca-Cola saying, here's the formula for Coke, right? Yeah. So, yeah. it's a big consideration. I'm not going to talk about you know how you come out with that, but it's something that's there, that even though the sandbox may exist, it may not be appropriate for any specific product or company. Yeah. Um, to get to your question about consumer protection, uh, one of the things that we confront every day is because we have students from uh, 190 countries who apply. Right. So how do you apply consumer protection to uh, people coming from pretty much every part of the globe because mm -hmm. their standards are different, their expectations mm -hmm. are different. Uh, we kind of fudged it because the, the idea again is that we are financing uh, students who are studying in the U.S. So ultimately they are coming to the U.S. They're going to be living and studying and working here. So we have basically applied the U.S. standard to consumer protection, which we think, mm -hmm. all in all, is a pretty decent standard to at least start from. We're certainly not taking the, the perspective that it is the only standard, sure. and we will deal with exceptions or uh, idiosyncrasies as they come up. But generally speaking, we provide disclosures in accordance with U.S. laws. We uh, provide uh, contracts. Uh, and other things in accordance with the U.S. laws. We try to deal with them so our servicing folks mm -hmm. do not call you five times a day just because you're from Brazil and not from South Dakota. Uh, we do not send harassing people out to try to collect payments because that's you know, not the way we do it. It may not be regulated in uh, Cameroon or in uh, French Guiana, but we don't do that regardless. Um, so this is kind of the de facto standard that we've established, but we're very cognizant of the fact that somebody may come to us one day from India or China and say, you can't do that, right. or you mm. should have done this and didn't. Mm. 
that's interesting. You know, whether it's collect a signature, or get a consent in a certain way, yeah. because as you know, these laws are so specific now. You not only collect consent, but it has to be done this way. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So we, <coughs> we cannot adapt our system to comply with every nuance of consumer protection out yeah. there. Yeah. But we try. We try to apply what seems to be a reasonable standard and then understand that we may have to adjust over time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I feel like that transitions a bit into the conversations over data protection, which I'll turn to Katrin to talk a bit about the research of it. But increasingly, I think there's a balance between consumer c protection constructs as well as sort of citizen protection or even business protection yeah. of data. And when we think about entering into different contracts or pursuing different business opportunities, a lot of us are concerned with, with our data and our data privacy, and that's increasingly becoming the case. So, um, Katrin, I'll turn it to you to talk a bit about uh, what you guys found in, in researching this topic. Okay, I maybe we'll just kind of toss out a couple of themes again that I think were really interesting that emerged from what we were looking at. And I, I mean, I found all of these comments fascinating. I wish we could like dive even deeper into all of these areas. Maybe we can continue the conversation somehow. But data protection is obviously a topic that has been really publicized lately. It's something that impacts each and every one of us. I think we've all thought about it very personally and clearly is a big issue, I think, for governments to grapple with as well as for companies to deal with. Um, so I guess one of the things that's interesting to me is, again, this notion of balance and regulation and how do you balance these different interests? How do you balance the role of the, you know, the government in, in protecting consumers and thinking about what their needs are with, a, you know, fostering innovation and, and business? It's very interesting, I think, right now, too, to see these kind of two big, you know, I guess, initiatives coming out that take very different stances on this. So you have the GDPR in Europe that is much more consumer protection focused, I would say, which I think is consistent with how Europe tends to regulate, like more focused on what the user's needs might be, which then has a very long reach, though, for anyone. I mean, I think you've all probably noticed this and things that are popping up in your, you know, in your own computers. But I mean, it's, it has an impact on, on you know, organizations and, and enterprises very, f you know, far outside of Europe. Um, and, and then there is the renegotiation of the NAFTA, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement that is dealing with this too, that I think tends, seems like it's taking kind of a different perspective, which is more focused on the data protection side and, you know, not allowing for, um, uh, you know, having stricter rules on data transfer and data localization. And so, I mean, there's been, I think, a big debate around that too, who should be storing and keeping the data. I think one of the things that's so interesting too to think about in some of these areas is that it's almost like a, you almost like have a data value chain, right? You have all of these different stages that data goes through, um, you know, collecting it, storing it, processing it, transferring it, disposing of it, and regulations really can impact any of those areas and so but you can't think about this in this very monolithic way I think it has to be tailored to really understand kind of the life cycle of data too which makes it very complicated and it inherently then gets into cross-border issues which I think we've touched on um, and I have to say I completely agree with what John said too that if we're starting to get more into international frameworks and you know, how to deal with the cross-border issues, we really cannot approach these issues just from the perspective of the US or Europe. Again, I know I'm putting these as examples because they're almost like sort of these extreme examples. And then, you know, then you've got like, you know, I think Jacqueline addressed this very well. You know, you've got other countries saying like, well, wait a minute, we're gonna just do this our w the way that's right for us, which I think is, I think makes a lot of sense. And I, I think it's good to see <coughs> what the examples are, which is why we tried to give as many of them as we could in the guide. But again, I think that's mostly just to kind of facilitate a conversation and not to say that there's a model. Um, so at any rate, I think those are some of the themes that seem to be emerging, you know, kind of how do you strike that balance and does it tipped in favor of consumer protection more? Is it tipped more in favor of data protection? And, and how do you, you know, how do you sort of strike a chord between them? And, and you know, what do you do like with all of these particularities across the data life cycle? 
And then what do you, you know, how do you deal with the cross-border issue, which I think is huge. And just, you know, a lot of these transactions that we're talking about are crossing borders. I mean, we talked about the U.S. market and how you have, you know, all of the different states. Well, I mean, in a lot of markets, in, you know, in Africa, for example, you have a lot of different countries that are all harmonizing too. And so the market is becoming, you know, a place where in order to reach a larger market, you are still dealing with like, you know, national law in a lot of different places. So I think, and again, I think that's going to be more and more of the trend, but it's, it's, it's getting more and more complicated and law is getting more and more complicated. So maybe, you know, we can talk about a couple of those areas and see what you all think and what you're seeing from your, you know, practice and your day-to-day work. Absolutely. Um, I'll just add in, um, in the event in Kenya, they're discussing two data protection laws in their parliament and trying to sort of streamline them together, one of which is very similar to the EU's GDPR, and the other one is, is quite distinct and is not sort of consumer uh, protection focused. Um, so yeah, Jacqueline, I'll turn to you if you want to speak a bit to what you're seeing in Uganda or in the region and um, your thoughts on where data protection may be headed maybe in the East Africa region? Um, <laughs> I actually don't think much, um, in part because Kenya is leading the conversation. Mm-hmm. I think the rest of us are really just waiting to see what happens with the Kenya example. Mm. Interesting. Um, so on that part, it really is, Kenya is a bit more advanced. Mm-hmm. Let's wait and see what they do, and we'll move along. Is it top priority right now? No. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I look at, for instance, the bills that are being discussed kind of in the near future in Uganda, it's just not on there. It came up, and it, there has been conversation around it, um, but it just hasn't been top priority. Not that it's not important, but I sure. just think when mm-hmm. weighing all the other pieces of legislation that are at hand, it's not there. Now, what is kind of of interest is definitely how do we balance cybersecurity? Mm-hmm. Um, but actual data protection, mm-hmm. what do we do? Who owns the data? Do we come at it from a yeah. consumer protection perspective? It's not on the radar yet. Yeah. It's interesting. Not that I've yeah. seen. And there's maybe one other uh, angle to this too that we should toss out there, which is more business self-regulation in this area yeah. as well. Because I think again, you know, expecting governments to do everything is yeah. probably some, you know, I think maybe, uh, obviously governments have to do certain things. They have to be the ones to pass the laws. They have to enforce them to some extent. But I think we see so many mixes, and especially in some of these areas where business is really, you know, leading the charge on some of the regulation and government is, you know, responding somehow. So maybe that's something else we could talk about a little bit. Now, from that perspective, I think that there's a lot that's going on that's really interesting. I think with the proliferation of businesses that are relying on their own algorithms Mm -hmm. and are giving people access to finance. um, So whether we're talking about solar home systems or whether we're talking about, you know, mobile loans, the question does come up, you know, who owns the data? Mm -hmm. Do the people who are giving their data understand what that data might be used for later? Um, And does it even matter? If I really just need the equivalent of $5 because that's what's going to put my tomato selling business, you know, over the top for the next week, do I really care about, you know, what's being collected? Probably not. But should we get to a point where people do have enough digital literacy that it matters and they know that there is power in the information they're giving out? Maybe, maybe not. Um, From a day-to-day perspective, frankly, I personally don't think it matters. I think it matters more that people are able to get their goods and services um, fast Um, because a lot of times, you know, the difference between getting access to power, getting that loan, you know, is kind of impeding on whether they live a more comfortable life. I think next stage of development, I think we'll start having more complex conversations, but now it's not the case. Now, a lot of the businesses, whether we're talking about the likes of Tala um, or other lenders, they are saying that that data is protected. And so I think there is a lot of reliance on self-regulation or Mm. really just believing what companies are saying and really relying on their goodwill. But at a time when they decide we are going to sell this, and what does that mean? Yeah. yeah. I think we're all kind of waiting to see what will happen. And I just don't think from a regulatory perspective, we've just kind of 
pushed our thinking that far yet. Yeah. Um, and I also don't think from a consumer protection perspective, a lot of the consumer protection advocates are there yet yeah. as well. Okay. Like we're dealing with, you know, fraud <laughs> um, yeah. and really simple <coughs> fraud. Someone yeah. goes to withdraw their loan um, and, you know, the person giving them the money steals from them, right? So it's like basic, and so and which also kind of leads to the cyber aspect. I think there's a ticking time bomb because we're in a place where not enough people know what's going on. They're giving information left, right, and center. Um, and you hear about cybersecurity and you hear that yeah. there are threats, right. but it doesn't really affect you. You're more concerned about someone who might jack you as you're walking across the street with that money. So, um, yeah, I think I'm also operating in a very different yeah. um, reality <laughs> than some of my colleagues. No, absolutely. It's very true. Um, I want to get back to cybersecurity, but I want to give John and Taryn's opportunity to speak a bit on data protection or privacy. So one of the interesting things that I think about is, is all data the same, mm -hmm. right? So uh, my company, we deal with quote unquote financial information, right? Which is, as John indicated earlier, highly, highly regulated. What we can yeah. do with it, where it goes, what the protections, what the rights are. So we're very comfortable with that. Uh, what I think is more interesting is when you try to apply a high touch regulatory model to other kinds of data, right? And I'm not gonna get into a discussion as to is that the same, um, the deserving of the same level of protection, but whether you like tomatoes or potatoes or you like to do something on a Tuesday versus, you know, this kind of social media type sure. of stuff, which I think has been somewhat the driver of a lot of the recent regulation, um, you know, Facebook, Google, or mm -hmm. the GDPR, I think was clearly targeted at yeah. these companies yeah. and their ability to aggregate data, draw conclusions yeah. from it, and yeah. then reuse it in a way that was not intended or at mm -hmm. least not disclosed. So do you regulate at that level, and then do you apply that regulation to everybody? Right. Because I would tell you for Empower, that would be a non-issue because we don't collect that information, we don't use that information. Now that's not to say we might not do it in the future, but we would not regard that level of data protection as being helpful to mm -hmm. a FinTech like us because we're dealing more with things like, where did you work? Where did you yeah, live? Right, yeah. What did you make? Uh, what's your credit look like? Have you been delinquent, right? This, so these are mm -hmm. kind of the more traditional financial mm -hmm. data uh, information that we're very comfortable with the current state of regulation. We obviously will work with um, the public uh, regulators and the like, uh, policymakers, to try to determine what is the most efficient regulation. But you know, the first thing that popped into my mind when you uh, posed the question was, "Gee, should we treat all data even as being the same? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And should you have a more discerning regulatory approach?" I agree 100% with Jacqueline, right? That is what I would call a first world problem, mm -hmm. right? For people here versus entrepreneurs who are just yeah. trying to make a living. And the price of access to mobile payments or the internet is you sign the contract. This contract basically says your data now is our data. Okay, well, for somebody living in Silver Spring, Maryland, that's a different mm -hmm. prospect than somebody living elsewhere. In the world. Absolutely. I think one thing we were hoping to do with this guidebook at the same time is say, you can put off these questions, but we've put them off in a number of countries and we're sort of struggling now to, to come back and, and figure out how to regulate this, how mm -hmm. to think about our data, the types of data we're putting out there. Um, but you, you both bring up a great point on that. And I think in this guide, we try to say, okay, maybe you're not quite ready to jump in head first. You don't need to do GDPR per se. Right. But you should be thinking about this as consumers, as yeah. you know, business to business transactions as well. We we want the private sector thinking about these topics. Um, John, I'll turn it to you if you have a comment on what you're seeing in, in the data protection yeah, space. Yeah, I don't think I have much more to add that hasn't already been said. I mean, the way I think about it, especially if you're looking at it from an international perspective or global perspective, is just the expectations of privacy depending on the country and frankly even just depending on I think maybe I'll just say age, um, mm -hmm. is just very different. I mean, you know, 
I uh, should probably just direct deposit my paychecks into Jeff Bezos' account because I spend most of my money on Amazon and Whole Foods, right? Yeah. I mean, it's nice because Amazon can, you know, I don't care if Jeff Bezos knows that I buy a lot of kombucha, right? Or like, you know, if that's going to somehow recommend services or goods, like that doesn't matter to me. That might matter to somebody else, right? I mean, you saw in California, what what happened there would not probably happen in Montana, right? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you kind of rationalize those expectations from the consumer? And totally to your point, not all data is, is yeah. the same. Yeah. Um, you know, my frequency of kombucha buying is very different than, you know, if I've paid my bills on time for the past right. 10 years yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, but from the business perspective too, it's, it's important because you know, these, many of these companies are international in nature. This technology is international in nature. So how do you uh, implement those products in a way that is efficient um, in markets that, that you want to serve and not get out of markets you don't want to serve because it would be too expensive to serve them because you have to geofence, you have to do yeah. any number of other compliance things. And to, to a point that Katrin made regarding self-regulation, you know, my sense of it is that both the technology is so new and the companies and products are so different, especially among fintechs. You know, you have to have practices to get the best practices to get yeah. the standards. Yeah. And yeah. I, don't, I don't I think we're just kind of getting the practice now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, I think, another reason why SROs or, you know, self-regulatory organizations or even something similar to that, it's, I, I just don't, my sense of it is just we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. Sure. Katrin, did you have a, a comment you wanted to add? On this, or I'll I'll shift to um, a cybersecurity related question. Yeah, no, I think we should probably, but I I think there's so much more that we could probably keep discussing, and that was a really good point that you just made. Although I think it's interesting because if if we're not there yet on the practices business right. practices side, and we're not yet there on the government regulation side, right. where does that leave us? Mm -hmm. You know, we have to because I do think that these are issues that are going to impact all of us in ways that we haven't even thought of yet. And that's true probably everywhere, right? Here mm -hmm. in Uganda, in China, and and so like having, and an, as Louisa said, like I mean, part of what we were trying to do is just figure out like how do we even get a conversation going? Right. And you know, as I said at the beginning, that's what made this guide so different in some ways because we're looking at regulation from the perspective of, of not even having figured some of these things out, right? This is not where we've got the systems and we're trying to understand them and see how they've worked and where they haven't worked. This is just trying to figure out like almost how do you approach something when you know that there are going to be implications for policy and regulation and how do you get people engaged? And you know, we did things with this that we hadn't done before, like do advocacy checklists and try to kind of think about like what questions would you even ask? Right. Not not presupposing that there's like a right way of doing this because I don't think there is but just to just to like get it out there and see how you talk about it but it really is this fascinating space I think and I do think it's I don't know maybe that's just because I am a lawyer and I think it's important <laughs> to talk about these things but I've seen so many cases where regulation goes in a direction that it didn't need to go Right. you know too too much regulation or sometimes not enough regulation or not enough interaction between the you know the users of the system and the regulators or the companies and the regulators and or you know or not or being afraid to have that interaction and I, I just think you know we maybe with an issue like this there's a way to prevent some of those things from going you know derailing I'm sure though there are going to be some lessons to learn that we again haven't even anticipated so and maybe that takes us into cybersecurity. Absolutely I think that that certainly takes us into cybersecurity and John you brought up the point that you can't avoid some of some of these questions like the digital economy it is global everyone is interacting with it to some degree um, certainly in certain in some countries more than others um, and there are many aspects to cybersecurity related to sort of uh, physical infrastructure of a country versus, um, you know, maybe our own mobile devices versus um, just data being stored by a company. So Jacqueline, I'm wondering if you can take us through a bit what you're uh, looking at at um, New America Foundation and sort of what your perspective is on how we should be thinking about cybersecurity either at a, a global level or at a national level. So I think my research is really focusing on using U.S. expertise, understanding U.S. expertise and how 
to basically build capacity across the world. There's a lot of good knowledge and brains here in the US mm -hmm. that I think could benefit countries that are kind of at zero in thinking about yeah. not only the legal framework, but practically how to best secure, especially productive yeah. infrastructure. So right. energy, yeah. um, especially government owned um, large infrastructure. So that's kind of a lot of where my work with New America is. In Uganda, it's really working with the Uganda Bankers Association to have more frank conversations about cybersecurity within the finance sector and what support they need to strengthen themselves. A lot of the banks are foreign owned, so it does become easy because they do get uh, support from abroad. But it's really how do we make sure that at the most basic level of literacy, people can try as much as possible to protect themselves. And if there is a state infrastructure issue, the bankers community is able to engage better with the state to make sure that the protection is there. A lot of measures have been taken by government, at least uh, to protect financial services. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel s still think that there are holes in other areas, so for instance, yeah. power, yeah. Right. that I think it will take time, but we're currently working on it. I still think, though, there is a ticking time bomb yeah, you know, right, right now. Uh, no one has really paid as much attention to Africa, thankfully, but I think when they do, <laughs> there's a lot of vulnerable infrastructure there. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, um, I was looking at a data point saying that 60% of uh, U.S. small businesses fail after a cyber attack, um, and I'm sure that number is comparable in, in many markets. So um, I'm wondering, um, John or Terrence, if either of you would like to talk about, you know, whether you are approaching, or perhaps John, sort of the country, the companies that you're working with, how you address cybersecurity with them. Is that something that they're concerned about um, as I sort of move up the chain in fintech? Yeah, you know, we don't, you know, it, me specifically, I'm, I'm certainly not a cybersecurity expert, and, and but obviously it is a part of everyone's business plan, and especially for financial services companies is um, a legal and regulatory requirement um, that they they have to meet. Um, you know, I think, you know, we work obviously a lot with digital asset companies, companies that are um, keeping Bitcoin or other digital currencies on behalf of their customers or, or under their own custody. You know, that is a very specific risk profile and a very specific business, but, um, you know, New York State actually came out with what's called the Bit License, which is a very specific regulatory construct for those companies about three or four years ago. And in that, uh, had really, really, really stringent cybersecurity um, mm -hmm. protocols that then ended up being applied to, let's just say, real financial institutions or traditional financial institutions, um, banks like the ones we know. So um, that's been interesting to see sort of how that started in, in a very emerging industry and then get applied to to a larger one um, but but you know with with digital assets and blockchain you know because you're dealing you know we all know how difficult it is to keep non-native digital information safe on the internet think about it you know digital currencies are native digital information native digital assets it is extremely difficult to keep that that safe um, and you've seen a number of companies in the space very good companies over the past five or ten years who have gone down because they had a cyber attack, and there's just no coming back from it. Yeah. Um, so that's that's what what we spend most of our time, I think, thinking about and dealing with. And Jacqueline, going back to you, in terms of education for regulators, but also small business owners that are entering the digital space, um, do you think there's a conversation taking place of this is a, a risk people really should be considering um, and investing in, and sort of not just in Uganda, but perhaps uh, what you're seeing across the, the region? I think the conversations are there, less so with SMEs, mm -hmm. um, definitely with um, regulators of different sorts, whether it's financial regulators, telco regulators. So the conversations are happening. Now getting from conversation to getting the capacity, I think that'll take time, mm -hmm. but there is definitely there is a conversation. I think what has been interesting for me is a lot of these conversations are actually starting at the board level. Mm 
and a lot of board members are first getting the education on it and then now pushing it to um, companies, both state-owned and private companies, to really rethink or rather think and incorporate um, IT security generally into their strategic plans. So it's happening, um, but it's definitely started with the regulated sectors mm -hmm. and then is moving on to the non-regulated sectors. Great, thank you. So Louisa, let me just interject also. Um, I don't need to repeat what Jacqueline and John already talked about. We as a company accept that we have a cyber security uh, responsibility. And we think uh, that most of the best work is being done that we're aware of and uh, we're being told. So for example, it's two-factor authentication, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very recent right. development. My struggle is to get my own internal people to adopt these things mm -hmm. to protect the customers that we have yeah, as right. opposed to worrying about what the SEC or the CFPB or any other regulatory body is yeah. going to be doing, right? Yeah. That uh, I'm very comfortable with, but my real struggle is how do I get my own internal people to spend the money yeah. to allocate the resources yeah. to integrate this stuff into our day-to-day -day practices when they're also trying to worry about, well, how do I pay this new marketing director and I want to go into these three countries, how do I fund that uh, marketing program? So the issue of cybersecurity tends to always be the stepchild because there's no revenue associated with it. Right. It's hard work that nobody wants to do and it's a distraction from quote unquote the real goal which is to you know increase customers and make money. Absolutely, and we I feel like I've heard this in in many panels related to cybersecurity that it's on all of us to educate ourselves and you know be thoughtful about cyber risks um, and it's it's not just going to happen at a, a regulatory or firm level it's mm -hmm. individuals all right. of us need to be and, present. and John is exactly right the best tool that I have is when somebody hits the newspapers mm -hmm. and then you see $50 million fine, or mm -hmm. you see, oh, X IT person lost their job and got criminally prosecuted, right? That's the best, frankly, incentive. <laughs> Absolutely. I hate to say it, but it's human nature. <laughs> um, I want to shortly turn over to the audience for questions. Um, but the last question I wanted to pose, and Katrin, you sort of brought this up in the beginning, but um, you know, we've discussed a lot between SIPE and New Markets Lab about implementation and enforcement, and it's also covered in the guide. Um, so I just want to go around quickly and ask each of you to maybe touch on um, your thoughts on implementa implementation and enforcement, um, because at SIPE, you know, we work at the intersection of democracy and economic development, and oftentimes rule of law and a strong judiciary is a key component um, when it comes to any sort of legal or regulatory implementation or change. And, um, you know, in, in developing this guide, I've become very interested in, in these uh, new legal and regulatory considerations in these topics um, for all the countries in which SIPE operates and a key concern that I have and, and perhaps it's unfounded to some degree is even if you get these laws on the books if they're not enforced especially with something that mirrors the EU's GDPR which has a sanctioning component if there is an actual fear of any sanctioning if you don't think it will really be enforced as it relates to maybe cybersecurity or data privacy and protection is that you know a bigger concern in this space than it is sort of laws generally, and I'm sure as attorneys that may not seem like a reasonable question, um, but I'm just curious to get your thoughts on that. And two, separate to that, um, so you could answer either one of these is, what do you see as the next steps, not just here in the U.S., but sort of to, to expand this conversation globally um, and also bring in countries in frontier and emerging markets to think about these issues to create sort of a stronger um, global digital economy with fewer barriers um, and that's more inclusive. So, Katja, maybe I'll start with you. Oh, I was going to say, I could go last. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> no, should I go last? Do you want to go first? It doesn't matter. I'm happy to answer if you want me to. Okay. 
All right. Okay. So I think, I don't know, on rule of law, I have to say, I just, I'm really, I've been, you know, doing a lot of work on this and a number of different areas. And I, I think that the traditional notions of rule of law are, you know, being challenged somewhat just by the way that the world works these days. I, I you know, have, first of all, never, I've been a lawyer for over 20 years and have never stepped into court unless I was on jury duty and had to go. Um, and so I, I think that a lot of, you know, just expecting something to kind of wend its way through to a, you know, some kind of a case and an outcome is, you know, a lot of these things are going to be dealt with before that ever happens, right? And so rule of law, I think, is this, I, I know you meant that too, it's an expansive notion, though, I think, of a system that has to work day to day on every level. Sure. And so I think what's interesting about these topics, though, is that, you know, part to me, part of rule of law is having a system that is participatory, mm -hmm. where you actually have engagement in how it develops. And so it's not just a government creating law and then everybody else following it. It's a whole ongoing dialogue. And I think we've touched on that in so many of the areas that we already talked about. I, I think it's about finding different ways to resolve disputes without having to go through courts. I think it's about, but it is about having a system that's workable and that's understood. And, and I think one of the big challenges to implementation is that systems don't work that way often, and that these rules are very complicated sometimes. I think that's why it's so good to have these dialogues beforehand, because maybe you kind of figure out what needs to be, what's important and what's not, and prioritize things. And you know, maybe going to a model that's really, really intricate is just not the right answer. I mean, I, I also, like you know, Jacqueline pointed out, I've seen so many countries where the legal systems have kind of been you know, cut and pasted, or somebody has come in and said, oh, we have a great model, let's just do what, you know, my country did. Right. That's not how it works. It's just not how it works. You can't cut and paste a legal system. You, it, it's, a, it's a work, it's a thing that people have to engage with. It's not something that you just go and put on paper. And I, I hope we're getting to think about that more. I also think, though, that it's, you know, we've really got to be conscious of the fact that in this global economy, we have to have models that come from everywhere. They can't right. just be models that come from you know, from certain countries. I think you pointed that out in financial services regulation too. And how do you get more participation in some of these international dialogues so that they're really balanced? I think that's one of the things we were thinking about as we did this, because these are areas where you don't have a lot of international dialogue yet in some areas. So maybe this is a chance to do it a little bit differently. And then I guess just in terms of what's next, I would say um, a couple of things that I think about are, you know, this is I think been a great conversation I wish we could, you know, do this in more depth and do it maybe around the world in different places too and talk about like some of these examples that Jacqueline brought in, you know, when we were doing the guide, we found interesting examples from, you know, throughout Asia, from Latin America. There there's so much to discuss here and it it does, you know, tend to play out differently in different parts of the world, but I I think maybe, you know, we could think too about different tools too to unpack some of these things and look at where some of the trade-offs and questions and practices and you know might be I, I've seen that helpful you know to be very helpful in other areas because this is just a lot to have to think about so Absolutely. I'll leave it with that but I look forward to the discussion and um, to all of your comments before that okay. yeah so I'll just comment in that I, I agree with you and I think that waiting for governments to implement, to, to pass and implement law is, uh, you know, logical, but I think uh, a very long, you have to take a very long-term view for many, many reasons. Um, I actually think that if you're looking for a quick hit or something that is workable more and more easily implemented, I do think that the private enterprise public policy model of mm -hmm. self regulation or at least like-minded individuals, like-minded organizations getting together, <laughs> coming up with a an agreed upon code of self-regulation is probably much easier and much more quick, uh, quicker to implement. And perhaps the foundation upon which more formal regulation can be based. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's, you know, voluntary, if it's within a specific either country or group of countries, I think the more practical aspects of regulation will be considered and dealt with in that mm -hmm. regard, uh, which includes implementation, right? Because nobody wants to spend a lot of time coming up with a real fancy code, right. which it just lies in the drawer somewhere, right? It's actually, as was pointed out earlier, 
is, is something that has to be adhered to, followed, modified, adapted, that kind of thing. And you're much more likely, I think, to find that happening in a kind of a voluntary organization context as opposed yeah. to an imposed legal context. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think the first good step, frankly, is the work that you guys did with this report. Again, you know, just looking at organizations within themselves, you know, people within <laughs> individual banks or companies just have very different interpretations of different words and, and, and sort of market development. So, you know, being able to kind of have a common language and taxonomy, I think, is, is a really, really good first step. I think, you know, going back to kind of the conversation around sandboxes that we were having earlier, I think, you know, even if just countries can have a website that has all of the mm -hmm. requirements mm -hmm. and rules and laws in plain English, yes. that simple. would be, that's really, I mean, it sounds like a simple idea, but it is like, hard it, it is it's hard, A, and in, no one has really done it. I mean, and that's sort of what, what's come out of some of these sandboxes that are like, oh, like, let's just have like a really, you know, easy website, like, you know, fintech.gov or whatever. Um, and, and I do think, you know, what you have seen between the sandboxes are uh, regulatory bridges. The CFTC has signed memorandums of understanding with, with the UK and Singapore. That's great. It's nice to connect really nice places, I guess, that, that people who, who fly across the world go to. But, you know, how do we bring in these emerging markets? You know, how do we set up a regulatory bridge between, you know, Ghana or Kenya or, or other markets? And, you know, even if it's not sort of ha allowing passportability between testing in these markets, if you just sort of say an informal dialogue about, hey, what are you seeing? Like, what's, you know, what are people bringing to you yeah. in Uganda? What are people bringing to you in Singapore? That would be really positive for regulators yeah. and for industry. Um, I think the business associations also have a responsibility. You know, American bankers should be talking to Uganda bankers, right? I mean, yeah. and, yeah. you know, we're not, again, my opinion, we're not there on in terms of an SRO or, you know, even close to that yet, but certainly there are bodies that should be talking to one another and you know convening bodies that should be should be helping put it together. And then the final thing is, you know, there really needs at the end of the day to be high level political leadership, both here in the US and elsewhere. You know, this is a next you know, the internet as we know it today is is just layered upon itself, right? I mean the internet that we experience today is very different than it was ten years ago and it'll be very different ten years from now. One thing that the Clinton administration did very well back in the 90s was um, put out what's uh, called the Electronic Commerce Framework, which then was adopted by Europe, what's called the Bond Declaration. And it was just principles-based guidance for, for um, policymakers and for regulators and, and to be thinking about this new technology. Um, that was really, really mm -hmm. positive mm -hmm. for the development of the internet as we know it today. I think it, something similar could be really positive for the next generation of the financial mm -hmm. services internet or mm -hmm. FinTech. Um, but you need high-level political leadership to do it. Right. Um, I think we're getting there here in the U.S. I think we're, we've been behind the ball, but, but some stuff's been positive. Yeah, but we need to keep that going. That's a good example. Yeah. Um, I think on the issue, I think following on, political will is definitely very important. Um, these areas, I think the digital economy needs to be thought about just a little bit more but I also think there needs to be a lot of I hate the phrase capacity building but there just needs yeah. to be a lot of teaching on what it really means because you have people that don't understand yeah. what it means who are being lobbied who end up assenting yeah. to stuff that they yeah. really don't right. understand mm -hmm. and so I think that element of you know engagement needs to happen who funds it I think is, mm -hmm. this is still a question um, and then once you know the laws are passed, who ends up engaging you know the judges and the lawyers and even more consumers yeah. on what the law is yeah. is another one. Yeah. Um, and I think that when I look at kind of the Ugandan system, that's where we kind of fall short. Is there are amazing laws yeah. that ultimately yeah. can't all be enforced just yeah. because not everything is in place. Yeah. Um, I think the sad reality is. The world is moving so fast and we are part of it and I'm just not sure if we'll be able to yeah. bridge the gaps yeah. fast enough. Um, as far as next steps, um, I agree with everyone, engagement, 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 mm -hmm. um, and cross-border engagement. How do we learn from one another? Um, how do different levels of business engage as well? Because right now what tends to happen is big business tends to come yes. to the table and small business doesn't. Mm 
Yeah. And so how do we actually engage small business more um, and make sure that the problems that they're facing, which a lot of the problems we've talked about actually end up being of most detriment yeah. to smaller businesses. Um, so they can, one, bring their issues to the fore, but also make sure that lawmakers understand their issues and incorporate that. Because, I mean, after all, like in a place like Uganda, there are not that many big businesses. It is yeah. mostly yeah. small businesses. Yeah. And understanding their concerns as we enter deeper into the digital economy is really important. Absolutely, and I hope that our part, our traditional partners, business associations and chambers start to speak more to their members on these topics. Um, I want to turn over to the audience to ask questions. Um, please state your, your name and um, address your question to someone on the panel or just generally. Um, yeah. Thanks. I'm Steve Liston with Equifax. Um, we're at a data insights company. You might have noticed there's a credit bureau. Um, but actually, and I say that uh, really because um, our business has changed over 10 years enormously, and um, we've had fairly recent experience in the cybersecurity area that was not very positive. If you want to convince people to um, take cybersecurity seriously, have a big data breach. It helps a lot. Um, <laughs> So uh, I wanted to throw a couple things out. I, this is a great discussion. I want to commend you for doing this because in my travels around, I do government relations. The biggest problem I found is a lack of understanding on the part of legislators and regulators and, of course, consumers and businesses. I mean, we're all struggling to figure this out. And, and it's leading to some very uh, bad laws uh, as people think, you know, data localization is a perfect example where um, you know, if it's here in my country, then it's safe, right? Which, of course, is exactly the opposite in many cases. Uh, localization will actually make it less safe. Um, but uh, so I think the, the education component is important. Um, I, I wanted to add to this that there's the question of what is data is a very uh, important question, and the Europeans and Americans have so far answered that question very differently. So if you consider data a part of the individual, um, that has inalienable rights that apply to that data wherever it goes. That's a very different concept of data, personal data I'm talking about, uh, than if you consider it a transactionable good, like I can trade my data for the use of a phone, and then it's no longer my data, right? It's, I've traded it. So I, I just, those are big questions, but the way you answer them, uh, I think we're struggling with that, has some fundamental um, applications, you know, to how you're then going to apply laws. Um, there's also the question of what is, so y you said, you know, what should different types of data be treated differently? And I think part of the problem we're seeing is that in the financial realm, for example, data that's not been considered traditionally financial data is being used for financial purposes, right? right. So people are doing credit scoring based on your social networks. Uh, and uh, and so is that now financial data? Uh, and you know, it raises a lot of questions. So I think we, we're in a new world of, of sort of, well, uh, it, how is, is it how it's used most important rather than what type of data that you're asking. Um, on GDPR, just quickly, I'm, as I'm going around, I see they're very aggressively, Europeans are very aggressively pushing GDPR as a model, right? Yeah. They're not just letting people choose. They're saying, no, no, you should do this. And GDPR has some um, really uh, problematic elements. The first one, of course, is really expensive. Mm -hmm. And when I was in the U.S. government, I always used to say the difference between us and everybody else is we can afford our stupidity. You know, we can, <laughs> we can pay for, for the really expensive systems we put into place, and most countries can't. And so they need to consider that implementation question. Um, the other problem it has is extraterritoriality, um, which I think was briefly mentioned here. And I think that's... Um, that's they're trying to deal with a problem, which is how do you, how do you apply these laws to Europeans when the server is someplace yeah. else, right? But the solution is very problematic because if every country applies extraterritoriality to their laws, you've got, I mean, you, it, it just kind of boggles the mind to think of the complications. So my question, after all that, <laughs> throwing that up, I'm sorry, I just want, it's a great discussion. My question is this. We're, we're, having, uh, we're seeing regulatory models change dramatically. So in El Salvador, we have three regulators. Um, consumer protection regulator, 
a banking regulator and a data privacy regulator, okay? And so the, the financial sector regulator is the old model. The data protection regulator is the new model. The consumer regulator is part of the new model. And my question <coughs> for all of you is, do you see anything that makes more sense? Do you think that we need to fundamentally rethink the regulatory model in order to get at this new digital economy, in order to set this framework? I mean, is the old model going to work um, as we look at a digital economy where every company is a data company, not just finance companies? So, so that's my question I'd be interested in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Do you, do you want to yeah. take a few questions, maybe, just so we don't run out of time? Sure. So totally your prerogative. That's yeah, awesome. absolutely. Um, we'll take the gentleman. Yeah, we can answer all of them. Thank you. Uh, Richard Jordan from Partners for United Nations. Uh, I'm wondering in terms of cybersecurity and the way that personal identity could be usurped, do any of you watch a TV series called Black Mirror, which uh, really delves into uh, f the dark side of how uh, <laughs> cybersecurity could be breached. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, George Taylor from U.S. State Department. And, um, you know, speaking outside of cryptocurrency, uh, blockchain has applications in digital ID, uh, value chain traceability, and improved cybersecurity, and smart contracts, as well as peer-to-peer uh, -peer decentralization of uh, industries such as energy. And um, I was wondering, you know, in your discussions, has any regulatory bodies have been working on these things in developing countries? Thank you. So um, we'll start with those three questions. Um, Katrin, if you want to start off um, on the sort of cybersecurity, and we do address data localization in here um, and sort yeah. of the existing regulatory models that you've looked at and yeah. whether you think there's one that works and then we can turn it over to others to comment on yeah. the other two questions. No, I mean, I was just going to make a couple of quick comments on, on all of the comments. First of all, also, thank you, Richard, for like giving us a new TV show to watch now. I'm always <laughs> looking out for new TV shows. So I'm excited. that. But I, I think that to your question about regulatory models, I, I think you probably could tell by some of the comments that I was making that that is something that we think about a lot, are different regulatory models and, and how should we you know, what applies in a certain context and what doesn't, you know, most of the work that we do is honestly working with partners to unpack some of the different regulatory trade-offs. And because we do so much work across borders, it's a very comparative exercise. And I, I think that exactly what you said about, you know, taking a model like the GDPR and not making it the model, Again, I've seen this play out in so many different ways in so many different sectors, and I think that here we have a chance to maybe change the dialogue. So that's one of the reasons I think this is so important. I do maybe think we need to think about what the regulatory models can look like, and I think that kind of tests everybody's you know, brains a bit to, to go beyond sort of these traditional notions, but I think we're going to have to do that here. So I'm not sure I have the answer, but I think that that's the right question to ask. And one of the comments that I just want to quickly make about what was these questions that were just asked and what we were talking about before is that I have seen in a lot of countries almost a trade-off between heavily regulating the market before things happen and being able to enforce it. And it's sort of, again, is kind of a, a, a funny way of, of kind of conceptualizing this, but if you try to control everything up front, it makes it really difficult to enforce because you spend you spend all of your resources on controlling and then you can't enforce. So again, I think that's one of the things maybe that needs to come into play in the balance, but there does need to be a balance. Um, you know, I think you're right to point out all of these different uses for something like blockchain, too. And I think th there can be some really tremendous upsides to something like blockchain. But then all these questions that come up as well, like I think particularly on smart contracts, where again, like these questions of sort of agency and consent are d very difficult to trace if everything is being done through a smart contract. And at some point, you really get out of the realm of people agreeing to something and machines starting to make decisions about contracts, which I think, again, tests all of these notions. Um, 
Um, and then the last thing that I just wanted to point out to you, which was something that John had raised earlier, which is when we look at these systems, they really are so complicated. We tried so hard with this guide to break the language down. We kept trying to break it down more and more and more in these legal concepts and break them down. And my whole team was like ready to, I think, you know, throw me out the, of the office for this because I kept saying, Sim simplify, 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 which is not what lawyers are trained to do. But I think that <laughs> your point though about like, is there not some way to have this in just simple, simple language and understand the requirements is really important. And we've actually been working very hard on doing this in a number of different contexts. We will diagram laws. We are you know, fascinated by some of these things that we've seen come out of other places like South Africa to use cartoons or something to explain some of these. And I just want to toss that out there too. I think there might be ways we could talk about this without using some of the even traditional kind of terminology um, that might be really useful in a context like this where it's so complicated. Absolutely. And Terrence, you had mentioned blockchain to me earlier. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, that's something that we're interested in. We're going to follow. I mean, I think there, as Katrina said there, Katrin said, there are some real practical limitations to that currently. I mean, the amount of computing power that you would need to process these, as I understand mm -hmm. it, I may not understand it correctly, the complexity. And I agree with you completely that at some point are you turning over decisions that should be made by the company by people to a machine, right? That's a, that would be a concern. Um, to the regulatory question, right, I think that's going to be an evolving model, right? So one of the things that I always think about when that question comes up is how do you change human nature, right? So the regulatory models exist in various stages. They're not going to go away. They're staffed by people who have their own interests, whether those are good interests or bad interests, and they won't go quietly, right? So if you, there is a philosophical, I think, you know, best practices that we all would aim for, and if we could create something de novo, it would not look like what it is today. So for example, the state federal banking regulation in the United States, who came up with that system, right? And, <laughs> But if you read history, you understand how that came yeah. about. And now it's so entrenched, you can't talk about getting rid of it. It's just not, it's a non-starter. So you deal with that system as best you can. Perhaps one day there will be an impetus to change that. But from my perspective, which is you know, a practical perspective, it, it's not going away. So I just have to deal with it as best I can. But I don't disagree with you at all that you know, is that really the best model? And maybe emerging markets have that wonderful opportunity of creating something de novo that can learn from the mistakes of the current yeah. systems and models out there. Yeah, I mean, Black Mirror is a great show. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm glad, I haven't seen the newest season, so thank you for not spoiling it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's obviously, <laughs> it's obviously a very bleak uh, look at like what the world which is very similar to ours, you know, what, what can happen to it if technology is used um, in bad ways and, and, you know, all of this stuff, right? I mean, ultimately it's shaped by consumer interaction with it, right? Because, you know, the market's trying to meet the needs of consumers and what they expect from the technology. You know, that's why, you know, I find cryptocurrency networks and blockchain networks really interesting because it is sort of this new layer on the internet to create an internet of ownership, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's a Bitcoin or it's a crypto kitty or you know so, some other digital collectible or a title, um, you know at least from what I've seen and, and maybe others have seen something different um, up here, in terms of you know there's a lot of potential for blockchain. There's also a lot of limitations where we're at now. Um, there's a lot of testing happening, not a whole lot of production yet, but probably you know hopefully will be in the next year or two. Um, most of the what I've seen in terms of what you want to call distributed ledger technology or enterprise or you know blockchain for supply chain or um, ID, that's mostly at least from what I've seen been in pretty well developed markets by pretty um, well financed governments that can you know fund these sorts of projects and testing. Where what I have seen in sort of more emerging markets or new markets, smaller markets um, in Europe, Africa, Asia. Um, is a focus on the cryptocurrency piece. Um, and, and that has been from mostly a sort of a regulatory arbitrage. Um, you know, they want to sort of create uh, 
you know, sort of a de novo environment for, for this new asset class and for these new systems, um, in part because they want businesses to come there. Um, there's also, I think, other political and, and, and local reasons too, but um, that's what I've seen just from my own experience, you know, with, with that industry. Great, thank you. Exactly. <coughs> um, I guess I'll start with the uh, Black Mirror. I haven't seen that, so at least <laughs> I'll be catching up on that. Very good. <laughs> um, from a blockchain perspective, um, there is a lot that people are trying to do as far as blockchain for development. We are currently, so, okay, there's the Ugandan government and then there are different tribal governments. In the Kampala, which is a capital, in the Kampala area, there is um, the government of the Baganda, which is the tribal group there. So we're actually doing, we're working now with the Baganda government and a local blockchain company to see if we can um, refine title in Baganda Kingdom because right now title is given by the king, but over time, you know, things get a bit confused. And so that's our one experiment in Uganda. Our hope is that if it works in the Baganda Kingdom, we can then take it to the government and say, this is how we can do things better at a national level. So we'll see how that works. Um, the Ugandan government has been very clear, cryptocurrencies are illegal. Um, <laughs> and so that's not a conversation that we currently have, but other as and then also the idea that it would come in with elections, I don't think will happen. Ah. Um, but I think anything that is pure development, at least we've been open to working with um, entrepreneurs in Uganda to fund them to, ha to make it happen. <coughs> Um, as for the regulatory models, I don't know. I think it's just everyone everywhere is just really trying to find their way. My general view is that the more regulators there are, the more confusing it gets. A lot of times regulate new regulators are started because of uh, competing local interests and the fact that ultimately it does provide jobs um, and there is new thinking. How that thinking clashes, uh, no one really thinks about. Actually, in Uganda, we're at a point where there's talk of consolidating. So I think every jurisdiction will try to figure it out in time. But I do think the challenge with any investor coming in is that you do need to engage all of them mm -hmm. just to make sure that your bases are covered. Otherwise, if you get the acceptance in one and the denial of other, that investment's not going to happen. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Please join me in giving a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so much. Um, and I know this conversation is just starting, so feel free to reach out to us at SIPE, um, and we hope to end at New Markets Lab and with the hashtag Digital Economy Dialogues. And we hope to keep this going, and we look forward to your thoughts on the guidebook and any feedback on today. Thank you. 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 Thank you.